Thank you. Um, OK, so my name is Han Song Bay, Riverbed CTO. And I'll give you the quick story behind the chai yun fat. I came home from work, long day, and I told my wife, hey, you know what? This was right after Crouching Tiger movie came out, right? The Flying Tiger, <laughs> whatever that title is. It said, hey, somebody told me I look like chai yun fat. And without missing a beat, my beautiful wife tells me, she looks at me, she goes, chai yun fatter, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the bun. But it was a good one. I got to respect that. So that's how the, the chai yun fat uh, part stuck. Um, but getting back to the real world, this is the world that our friends in infrastructure live in today. Right? So if you look at this diagram, we have data centers, multiple data centers. Um, we have campuses, branch offices, hotel rooms, tablets, mobile users, sales guys sitting in a car with a jetpack. Doesn't matter. And then we have two modes of transportation. We have MPLS, multiples of, doesn't matter. Then we have public internet, which is interesting. Because internet is two things, three things, wait, four things. Why? <laughs> because recreational internet. We all go to recreational internet, right? Who doesn't go to YouTube? Um, then we have infrastructure as a service. That obviously is taking off like a rocket. And then we've had infrastructure, uh, serv uh, software as a service here as well. The fourth one, though, is internet as a transport back to my data center, internet as a transport to the other sites. I get 500 megabit home service from Fios. Why wouldn't business take care of it? Right? Why wouldn't they take advantage of that? Um, and so we love plentiful bandwidth. We don't care. Because you'll see that it's not about the bandwidth, could care less. It's about the latency and application performance. Okay. So why did we go down this journey of SD-WAN? Show of hands, how many of you guys heard SD-WAN more than 40 times in the last two days? Yeah. SD-WAN, <laughs> SD-WAN, SD-WAN, SD-WAN. I'll tell you why it's different. It's not a technology looking for a problem. Because it solved all the problems that I faced dealing with infrastructure at the largest scale. And those of you watching on the internet in infrastructure, Memorial Day, what do we do? Migrate data centers, because that's a guaranteed three-day downtime. Labor Day, what do we do? Another data center, because that's a three-day guaranteed downtime. 2 a.m. change controls. How many of you are sick and tired of going on change control at 2 a.m., waiting for somebody to join? Every five minutes, someone says, hey, sorry to interrupt. Can I get an update from my management? Right? And you're working. <laughs> five minutes later, beep, beep. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Can I get an update from my management? Okay, and you can't get any work done. That ship has sailed if you get software defined when right. So what are the ingredients? So if I sum up what Josh talked about, you can make the sausage, you can enjoy the sausage. That's it. <laughs> That's what SD-WAN is. You can go out and kill the deer, the pig, the cow, skin it, grind the meat. And she's looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> there are three or, vegetarians in this group, by the way. Right. <laughs> or you can just go buy it. Josh says, I'm from New York, right? We love hot dogs. Put it on the barbecue and enjoy it. That's what SD-WAN is supposed to do for you. And we're going to show you live today what it means. So why is this a pain point? Because at the branch location, let me ask everybody a question, especially those of you out there worried about security. If you're using Salesforce, or if you committed to Azure, or Azure for the EMEA folks, <laughs> and your data's out there, why is getting there from your branch location a problem? Why do we all back call the traffic to the data center to go out to the internet? Because it's hard to turn on the spigot of internet at the branch just a little bit. It's hard. How do I make sure that you don't go hog wild with YouTube, Facebook, or the next social media phenomenon? How do I do that? And if I do, do I want to be in the business of cranking that sausage at every remote site? Of course not. So you're going to see how SD-WAN changes all of that. Okay? Another way to sum it up, we're not routing IP packets or IP packets. We don't care. We're routing application. So think about that. When you route application, your entire world changes for the better. And we're going to show that to you live. So let's go to the website. And this is Brad. Why do I call it Brad? Anybody remember Pulp Fiction, one of the best movies ever made? 
I got the big brains on Brad. <laughs> That's SD WAN. Okay? So Brad is going to help me get my life in order. No more 2 a.m. change controls. So let's kind of show you what our SD WAN is made up of. First, we're going to skip through some of these because he's going to go into it and delve into it. But let's go to network design first. And first, we have sites, obviously. Okay? So we need to add some sites to our software defined fabric. How do we do that? We'll do the manual one first because it's quick and easy. So let's add a site. We're going to NYC. I'm from New York. Uh, so we're going to add New York. And all we're doing is putting a Google map and play, putting a placeholder in my world, my software defined world, and New York just popped up, as you can see. All right? Let's add one more Boston real quick. So now we're adding Boston. Again, I need a placeholder so I can start connecting the dots once the hardware boots up. Okay? That's what we're doing. There's Boston. Now, those of you on the internet with large sites are thinking, this point and click, who wants to do this? I mean, that was pretty quick. You got to give me that. But if I have to add 50 sites, do I want to be add, pipe, add, forget that. So at the end, we're going to show you how using REST API, mm -hmm. you can suck all of that in and build it in mass. And we're going to show that to you. Okay? So once we have the site built, we have uplinks, which is internet and MPLS that we define for you automatically. They're all defined. But let's go to the zone. So this one is important. Zone is essentially a subnet. But it's more than that. Because to us, it's a container that we can use to identify what you can or can't do. OK? So yes, it represents a VLAN. Think of it that way. But for us, it's a logical construct so we can do more things with it other than just a line on an access list. OK? So in our traditional world, when we talk about access lists, we're talking about a CIDR block of some sort, wildcard mask, right? Instead, we're going to use common language and just zones to do something. So the first example that I like to show you when you route application, we had this legacy HR application. And wouldn't it be nice if I could isolate HR users to that server at the infrastructure level? Why not, if it's easy? Okay. And one of you guys had a financial background, if I remember right, right? Who had the financial? Um, no? No financial background? OK, that's fine. So Nobody's going to own up to it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had the pleasure of working on the Federal Reserve Network. Okay? And it was the one change where I felt compelled to go to the data center because I didn't trust a terminal server. I didn't trust a PSTN backup because if I screw up this change, the Fed Reserve backbone is not going to work for my company, okay? Where trillions of dollars go through it every hour, if not every minute, okay? So the old way was the blue Cisco console cable, plugging in, going to it. And then, and then something else happened. These freaking laptops, they stopped making serial ports. And then what do we do? We all went out and bought a USB to serial converter, right? Not all of them worked, so we had to make sure that that kind of the old now we're going to talk about the new, OK? So let's get back to our zone. And, and a server, it's an old application, homegrown. I'm sure there are thousands of applications that are running. So we're going to add a server definition called HR. And all we're going to do is just create a name, give it a description, HR. And we're going to add as a host name. We could use IP addresses if we want, but why? All we're going to do is hr.acme.com, OK? IP address is dead. We don't really care. Well, we could. That's it. We have now identified an entity called HR. So how are we going to mix that with our zone and our firewall rule to do this? So let's go to the rules. And I'm going to create a security blanket from the data center, from the cloud, that extends the branch at the click of a button. I'm increasing our security posture, click of a button, to all sites. Why not? It doesn't take me any second to do. So at the, at the very top, we're going to say HR users An Active Directory group, we suck them all in from Active Directory. We allow to where? Selected application. Which one? HR, the one that we just created. Got a quick question there for you on this. So if, you, if you're using CMC and you're using Steelheads, does any of the data from the rule sets and the policies that you build inside Steelheads translate into this? Is there any, 
Any crosstalk there? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about that. So the question was, what's the, 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 you know, the steel head doing the optimization piece, application acceleration, and steel connect? They work in hand in hand in one box to handle the performance that the steel head's famous for, and we're going to show you what that means, and the steering. So if I'm being honest, our steering part was the weaker piece. Okay? And so that's why we added the steel connect, these rules that apply to the same hardware box. Half the, half the box is doing steel head optimization, acceleration, and the other half is taking care of the steering. Okay, and we can hand off uh, using DACP, uh, other functions that you guys know from steel head so as well. So just to clarify, those functions can be combined into yes. the same piece of hardware now? Yep, okay. and in fact, coming, and we'll talk about the roadmap and uh, the future work stuff in the, in the end of the hour, uh, but the UI will be even uh, unified as well. Okay? All right, so I'm going to allow HR and submit, and that's it. And all I have to do is I can go back and create a do not allow for everybody else. And I protected my HR app at the click of a button. Does that mean default rule is allowed then? A default rule, it will sh yeah. So the default rule is allowed because I'm not preventing you from getting, so you can do it inverse or you can do it the other way around. Okay? Now, keep in mind, that was my change control. So... Vivek kind of stole the thunder there. That's my change control, okay? And those of you that require Visio diagrams, just take a picture of the red, <laughs> <laughs> and then the next change control, post change control checkout is it's green. And by the way, I'm being facetious here, but there's an important point to be made here. When you, do a, when you work at a large company and large enterprises, and you have tens of thousands of routers, the actual change is only 50% of the battle. You have to have a legit back out. Right? And you can't just go up arrow no, up arrow no anymore. Right? So design packages are very complicated beasts. It's, it's, it's a working, living organism, the network. So for us, change control on, back out plan off, and that's it. Okay? Now, we did the HR, and uh, let's talk about extending the security even more. Uh, and we're going to talk about social media. Who doesn't use social media these days, right? Who doesn't use recreational, <laughs> right? And I, and I got it while you guys were, oh, actually, when Josh, when you were talking, I, I tweeted. Okay? I wanted to get in on that goodness. Um, <laughs> and by the way, Twitter founder was a Riverbed employee. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, but um, our SVP of engineering walked him down at the time. This elevator right here walked him down and said, hey, you know what? If this microblogging thing doesn't work out for you, <laughs> you're more than welcome to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Billion dollars later. Um, so let's talk about, um, a, we're going to do a firewall rule for SFDC and YouTube and all that stuff. So as, I'm going to change the screen here on this side so that we can create a rule and I can show you what it means to extend that security with no effort. All right, first, um, this is my web, my browser right there, and I'm going to go sit down. It's all right. And I'm going to show it to you that this is all working. None of this is hand-waving. So I'm going to go to YouTube, and then I'm going to go to Twitter. All right. It's right there. Right now, I just tweeted. Um, so now, it's important. <laughs> Something's happening. YouTube is going viral. For the time being, let's cut it off. I'm an abuser. All I'm doing is watching YouTube every day. In case my boss is listening, I don't. I'm checking it up. <laughs> but cut me off. So what is, what is Vivek doing right now? He's creating a rule that says, that's me, myself, and I right there, HSP24. He's denying what? Now we're using deep packet inspection. So we're going to put Twitter, YouTube, and we're going to add Google Video, because sometimes YouTube is also Google Video. We found that out. And then, because I have a, we're in California, so I'm going to say this, I have a little 16-year-old teenage girl inside of me, Snapchat. <coughs> <laughs> okay, click on submit. He's going to deny that rule you saw here. Change control, click change, click to okay. You just saw me go out to YouTube. You saw me go out to Twitter. Um, all I did was just walk away, and then I'm going to come back here and go to Twitter. Nope. That's not, not working. Let's go to Google. Working just fine. So, real time remediation of a guy who's abusing his privilege. 
So does this policy get pushed out to every node in the network? Every node. Okay. In real time. When I say real time, it could be a minute. Sure. Okay. I had a question. So sure. you, you showed earlier when you were creating the HR rule um, using DNS, and this is a little bit technical question, but um, my, 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 my question is generally in, in an enterprise environment, DNS is deployed at the data center. And so if you're pushing you know, uh, rules out to the edge that are dynamically resolving via DNS and then you're going to start and you lose connectivity to DNS, what do you do? How, how, do, you, how do you ensure that you're always going to have resolution at an edge site uh, when that service is someplace else? Okay, so this is a question is about how do I maintain that DNS resolution and the ability to get out? Uh, so that's, that doesn't change because of us, but we can enhance it because all of our gateways can act as a DNS a server, so we can extend that service out. Uh, the other piece is, um, think about this. I'll, I'll just kind of jump ahead a little bit, right? What if, because you know, by any measure, Azure does a pretty good job of uptime. What if I could put my Active Directory or DNS server up there and not have to worry about it? The problem is, how do I connect easily to Azure? Okay, so and I'll show you that in real time, how we handle that piece. Okay? So are you caching the, the DNS answers then locally so that... Um, if we are acting as a DNS server, we can. Otherwise, we're looking at deep packet inspection, also matching IP addresses to the DNS resolution to see where we're going. We're also looking inside using deep packet inspection to make sure that you're not tunneling YouTube through some other means. Okay? Um, all right. So we did the, um, uh, we did the YouTube um, Salesforce. So because we're in Salesforce world, I sell for a living. My title might be CTO, but as uh, Jerry liked, my boss Jerry likes to say, Hansa, you're in sales, and he's right. So <laughs> Salesforce is important, okay? And this is about that spigot at the branch. I want to give you internet access. If the data is already in Salesforce.com, why is letting you go direct from the branch such a problem? We talked about this because I can't just give you Salesforce access. It's hard to do that. Now, I can deploy firewalls everywhere, right? Great idea until you get the budget approved. Good luck with that, right? So how do I extend this security posture? Let's have a bespoke spigot that allows Salesforce, but nothing else maybe, or Salesforce, YouTube, and lower quality of service. So we're gonna go back to our path rule, and we're gonna change it up a little bit. Firewall was about, it's a binary decision. You can go, you can't go. Now, I want to steer that traffic based on application. We're going to route applications, not packets. So it says position at the top applies to everybody in my company and go to salesforce.com. And we're going to say, because it lives in the internet, go direct to internet. So my path preference is internet first. But because it's important, I'm going to backhaul you through route VPN. This is our IPsec going through the internet to the data center and popping you out through the internet there. Okay. Can you can you explain that again? Like yeah. because it's important, we're using the route VPN. What help me understand? Oh, absolutely. What you mean so by what I'm saying is I'm giving important. you a redundant path. I want okay. you to use internet right. because you're going direct internet breakout. I okay. thought those were the same option, not two oh. different ones. Yeah, so like the internet first. If that for whatever reason doesn't work, then route VPN. Go through. Uh, I'm sorry, MPLS. Sorry, MPLS. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and route VPN is. We're going to backhaul you through the MPLS, right? Because if internet breaks, but in a mi in a micro segment, yeah. hmm? in a micro segment, in a segmented flow that's isolated from that's other right. Traffic. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, quality of service. We're going to make it uh, high because it is Salesforce.com, and we click on submit. Okay. What have I done? I've turned on that spigot for you or any users to go out to the internet just enough to get your work done. And I can be as granular as I want. I can block your YouTube. I can block your Snapchat, okay, in real time, right? I can turn it on, turn it off, and I defy anybody in the traditional infrastructure world to do what I just did in less than 10 minutes. I turned off YouTube, turned on YouTube. I created an application, made sure that only HR people can get to the HR app. And so how long way, would it take to deploy? So it says all sites. How long would it take to deploy that to say a thousand sites? We haven't tested that yet because yeah. it's been real time. You saw how fast yes. it was. Um, I'm sure there's a limit. We think probably about a minute. It's hard to quantify. Not that. hours. It's hard to have a thousand people yeah. click on YouTube at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, but you're saying not hours, not 
It's not. No, and in it's fact, minutes. the reason why yeah. we know that is because the boot up time of these devices, SD-WAN gateways, is less than a minute. Okay, it's very lightweight. All right, um, so we've done the application steering. We're routing applications, not packets. Do you guys see anywhere where it says IP address, quad or IPv6? No, of course not, because we're routing applications. Go ahead, Zeke. And actually, to, just to provide a little bit of clarity, uh, what we have not shown you, if we can, if, in fact, if we can go to uh, organization and just show the networking default. As a company, for, uh, for this uh, r uh, organization that we have shown here, we have chosen to have MPLS to be, always be the primary carrier of our traffic, which is why we were able to move Salesforce to be internet preferred first. If that fails, then drop back to MPLS. So the overall rule by default for, this, for all of our sites is to prefer MPLS. This is how we have chosen it. You can easily swap that around to be um, uh, uh, route VPN and then MPLS first. It's just, it's all policy driven. It's all how you would like to do it. So in, in, in the infrastructure that we're talking about right now that we're demoing, we, we've assumed that we've got an appliance that has an MPLS connection and some other internet connection. That's correct. Reason, right? That's right. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the, the, the we kind of got a, a deep packet inspection inside joke, but can you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say deep packet inspection and sure. how you do that application ID. Absolutely. So we have Navel, we have uh, Steelhead. For the customers that have Steelhead, you know that we have over 2,300 signatures that we um, identify fingerprint. And so we've taken uh, the most popular of those and, and, and ported them over to our Steel Connect. So between the combination of DNS, looking at DNS, and fingerprinting of the application itself using the Navel engine, that's how we do the DPI. Okay, no secret sauce there. What about custom applications? Is there a way to fingerprint custom applications? Yep, so we can do, do a couple things. You saw me create the application based on, uh, in fact, you can go there real quick. So I'll show you the different options. Um, and then we have a catalog there, obviously. Uh, so the application that you can define, we have uh, device by group, we can do subnets, we can do the host tuple, and we can do host names, okay? okay. Which is a traditional uh, way of fingerprinting with the exception of maybe the, the host name, right? Most of us in the infrastructure live in the IP port and maybe the device group name. So when it says internet only, that's only to resolve to external DNS, yeah. not internal DNS? Okay. Were you cracking open TLS as a part of this? Um, so TLS, so we'll talk about TLS from a par uh, perspective of yes, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem, right? We understand that it's being more obfuscated as we go to TLS, elliptical diffie hellman et cetera. So Steelhead, have been accelerating SSL for six, seven, eight years. How do we do that? Because we have a secure mechanism to look inside and be able to accelerate and fingerprint and identify the results. So the added benefit of us being able to accelerate the traffic gives us visibility inside of SSL as well. Okay. As, as one cross-reference, so back in uh, like August of 2015, we did a session on the SSL and how we will securely participate in the you know, end-to-end -end delivery of that without, and it was really important, without having to send private keys out to the endpoints. That's something that was part of the patented secret sauce of Steelheads for many, many years. And uh, we had some good, good banter between uh, one of the architects, I think Denise actually at the time asked a really good question. Um, so uh, viewers oh, at home. Good memory. I was obviously you're correct that I ask a good question. But <laughs> uh, the viewers at home, go back, look up the uh, the session on on SSL, um, and you can get a lot more information on how we do that. Cool, thank you. Yeah, uh, it, can you tell me also that that QoS drop down? Uh, what is that doing? Oh, absolutely. So that's between uh, um, internal app. It's mostly internal, obviously. Um, so if we just go to the uh, the traffic rule there. <clears throat> yeah. So we have the traditional. If we click on here, we have what's called cake. Um, um, engine that al 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 allocates based on urgent, high, normal, and low. And we have pre-mapped uh, DACP code points into here. EF obviously goes into urgent. We have others that map into it as well, okay? Or you can just use your DACP. If you prefer to use DACP code points, do that, okay? And you can see, oh, yeah, there you go. And then so you can see all the DACP code points. If you like it and love it, you can just tag it that way. We'll tag that application with that on the DACP and then let it out.
Okay. There's nothing. But, but that, that, so is it you, just a marking okay. issue then, or, or I mean, if you ob observe the congestion packet. on the internet, can you? You the mic. Yeah. yeah it's it's. So, uh, so I'll address that in just in two different ways. Um, because we have the steelhead, we have what's called a two-way QoS. What that means is I can say, if I'm going direct to internet for Office 365 and YouTube, obviously. Okay, Office 365 multi-tenant, I'm going directly out through the internet. What happens if YouTube catches on fire? Meaning it's going viral, everybody's using it. What I can do because I have the ability to accelerate the application into the cloud is to start dropping Facebook traffic, for example. I can throttle Facebook to ensure my Office 365 has adequate bandwidth. What that means is, so for those of you that are technical, obviously all of you are technical watching this, QoS outbound is easy because I'm tagging it and handing it off to the carrier. What's hard is how do I prevent an onslaught of Facebook traffic to my branch when I have Office 365 coming down that same internet pipe? So what do we do? Using our uh, ability to accelerate an application, we throttle Facebook, we purposely drop packets to throttle it to make room for Office 365 on an inbound basis. Okay, does that make sense? That, that's what I expected you to say. I was just yeah. <laughs> wondering. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so. Before we move on there. So yes. Just some caveats on that, right? We're assuming both ends of a link that we control. So something that's out to the internet, obviously you're not going to be able to do that on, right? You, you can drop ingress where it, when well, it gets Facebook, to you. But, no? but it doesn't help you on the link, right? Like it, it helps you on the interface, but if you drop it once it shows up to your box, it's already eaten up your bandwidth. Yeah, but we're just hitting on TCP back. to throttle down because that's gotcha. what so TCP You guys are hitting it on TCP and that's how you're, that's how you're handling it. Instead of that's controlling right. the far end, yep. you're hitting it with TCP. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. All right. So, uh, which is kind of unique. If you think it through, it's kind of unique. And then we'll talk about how, when it comes to cloud, and it's an extension of my data center, how that equation changes. Yep. Okay. Yes. A, a, a corner use case, and tell me to be quiet if I need to. But you've got the route VPN there. That looks like it's only got one place it can go. Can I build arbitrary topologies like regional breakouts? So instead of backhauling to a data yep. center globally, Absolutely. I might want to go to Sydney, a New York, sure. yep. London. Yep you know, wherever it is, and I, my route VPN should go, you know, my-, my Absolutely. It, yeah? Absolutely, so by default we do full mesh, uh, but quite frankly, you're absolutely right, right? Mm -hmm. A perfect example is like Indonesia or Singapore, Hong Kong is a regional APJ hub that all the other leaf uh, locations, Vietnam, et cetera, can come to. So we can mix and match hub and spoke with full mesh and connect the two together. So you've got multiple topologies, yeah, or right. arbitrary application topologies right. as you need. That's right. Okay. okay. We can follow your Visio diagram and, and do hub and spoke here, full mesh here, and then more hub and spoke there. Um, mix and match. And everywhere. so to expand on that, can you even set preferences like in the region, your failover regions? Because I'm dealing with that issue right now internationally of that hub and spoke, but you want to have these regional internet dump off gateways. Is that you know, can you even say, I want you to fail to region one and then region two if you lose. Oh, fail over to yeah. a different Right, hotspot. I've got all my little regions and I want to prefer all the branches okay. that aggregate into that data center and go out of that region, but. Yeah, so at the moment we have um, it, it hubbing to one region. We are working on uh, hubbing to multiple regions from a leaf. Okay. And then you got the ability yeah. to go say. I can pick region uh, two is the best next option. Seattle and Denver, okay. rather than just being uh, hubbed into, into Seattle and that failing and you, you're not there. So we're working on that multiple hubs off the one leaf. Okay, cool, thank you. So, let's talk about um, bolt-on versus built-in visibility. Very lucky because we have a whole business unit uh, that's dedicated to visibility. So, I do this change control. I buy into SD-WAN, it's great. Cheap internet bandwidth, turn it on. What if users start complaining? Or what if the boss says, hey, how did that change go? How did it go? Just because they're not complaining, do I not have a problem? We all know that some people will complain no matter what, and this is a true story. And I'm dating myself, but we went from thick net, yeah, <laughs> you can kind of date myself, right? <laughs> thick net to newfangled cable called Cat3. And we did that for a college of engineering. And uh, her name was V, I know, because she had a VI shorthand poster behind her for VI, but it was, her name was V. And she said, Hansi, he goes, I know you did some changes, right? And I said, yeah, V, we, we, everything is great. You logged in, you're good. He goes, did you do anything with the coffee pot? I <laughs> said, I said, V, I'm sorry? I said, coffee pot? He goes, ever since the change, the coffee doesn't taste the same. Oh, <laughs> oh my. 
V, if you're watching, my apologies. Um, <laughs> but I didn't say what school that was, so I have some anonymity there. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to our Brad here. Um, we're going to talk about um, SFDC and proof. Oh, we did the SFDC. We're going to talk about proving what was our change like. So let's log into end user experience. And we can close that out. And in a glance, we're using end user experience. Again, this is a, 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 the, our Steel Central visibility business unit that has this ability to very granularly look at how the applications are doing regionally by building, by business unit, et cetera. But for me, as an infrastructure guy, I care about what was the impact of my change. Let's trust Steel Connect, the SD-WAN. Let's trust Brad, but let's check, verify him. So let's go to my dashboard. I have one called uh, SD-WAN migration. And all it's going to do is show me, I just picked a random time, says, this is when I did the change. This is before and after. For you Eternity users out there, normally you know that this validate change is like eight hours or maybe a day or multi-day migration. Software defined when is on, off. So I purposely said this was our change control. Okay? And then we come over here and we see that some item takes longer. Here's the bar. Some of them are faster. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe could be bandwidth. I don't know. Could be latency. Earlier on when I started, I said it was never about the bandwidth. Saving bandwidth is great icing on the cake, but it was always about the latency. Okay? And we're going to prove it to you. Right now, we're going back to my desktop. Oops. Let's operate. Oh, there it was. Yep, perfect. And on the right, you're going to see Z, you're driving, right? Good. We're going to do a file transfer from the cloud. This, this turns out to be Amazon. I have a server out in Frankfurt. Okay? And I just have a, a simple, um, but this could be SharePoint, this could be Office 365, this could be your own uh, hosted application, Azure. So on the right, we have the acceleration on because it's a box, right? We can do both. We can steer traffic, we can accelerate traffic. Over here, me, not so much. Let me show you the difference between accelerating into the cloud and not accelerating into the cloud. We're both using Chrome, like for like. And what we're going to do is there's a PowerPoint file up there that we're going to download. Very common SharePoint-like use case. I download it, someone emailed me, I want to save it to OneDrive, et cetera. We support all of that. So we're going to click on it on a count of three. OK, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go first. Go Z. And there it is. Let me zoom in. So I'm downloading 0.211 meg, not too bad. Over here on the left, so let's compare. The same bandwidth. We are identically connected, although I have the awesome Surface Book for a little <laughs> Microsoft product placement there. I'm still at 0.2, two minutes left. It's going to kind of stuck there. And Z's over here done. So yes, steering and connecting to the cloud is critically important. But why did you build that tunnel? Why did you build that IPsec full mesh VPN tunnel? Just to build a tunnel? No, so your users can use the application regardless of where it may be hosted, okay? We're completing that vision of cloud. Application guys figure this out. A phone call, Ansible, Puppet or Chef, 100 servers just booted up. I'm now giving you the ability to connect to it at a moment's notice. We're going to show you that live in just a few minutes. And number two, users are happy because I've beaten the problem of latency of going to Frankfurt, Germany. I just got a question for you on that. Yeah. So I know in, in, the, in the steelhead world, you guys kind of have a term called the inner channel that kind of forms the mm -hmm. TCP proxying of the yep. WAN optimization. Is that technology kind of now baked into the SD-WAN? Because it is. what I've seen you just do is very much like you know, what a steelhead does when it you're is. Doing, you know, international yep. transfer like that. Yep, absolutely. And it is. And the magic that you missed is remember that steelhead SC that Josh talked about? It's one box. Really? It's doing both. Okay. We'll get it, we'll get not it only that. are you getting the acceleration benefit, not only are you getting the telemetry from the cloud, but you're also being able to steer it mm -hmm. using what's your spread. 
And that goes into replication as well. If you want a DDP replication, that there's there's use cases for that because I know we we've used steelheads for that yep. too, and that would be an interesting Absolutely. thing you to be able to steer traffic. your replication traffic to yes. different points and dedupe that across data centers. In fact, a customer Absolutely. on a proof of concept figured it out. He said, "I got a point point right now. It's damn hard for me to go direct to internet using IPsec and identify that traffic, right? Because think about it, oh, oh, it yeah. can be done with BGP. It can, right? It's harder, <clears throat> but it's harder." So again, you can make the sausage or you can enjoy the sausage. <laughs> okay, we're right back to that. All right, so you saw what we did. Um, now let's talk about the cloud. Oh, good. Yeah. Z is taking control of my console here, of Brad. And what we're going to talk about are a couple different things. What if I can do the same thing that the app dev guys can do? What if I can connect to every instance of Amazon, click of a button, without worrying about BGP? What if I can connect, and this is mind blown, what if I can connect my Active Directory server in Azure, Azure, into Amazon? So my server's in Amazon, I don't need another identity management. I can use Active Directory in Amazon because what I'm going to show you right now is the ability to connect Azure to Amazon as if it's sitting right next to me. That's what we're going to show you right now in real time. So, Z, give us a tour of what we're seeing here. We got uh, a lot of green lines there. Sure, yeah. So, just to highlight one point, the file transfer we just completed was actually being pulled down from Germany. That was a ser file server in Germany. We were pulling that file down. That's why, you know, you're noticing, it, oh, it took a little bit longer than normal. It's because the latency uh, is about 100, 180 milliseconds or so from, uh, from here to, uh, to Germany. And what we have here on the map is, all the way right here in Europe, is an AWS instance running in, uh, uh, run, running in, in AWS. We have spun up, on demand, a, a gateway virtually out in, uh, and connected it to one of our VPCs in AWS. So let's do that, Z. So, While we're talking about this, <clears throat> let's kick off connecting to Azure and see how long it takes. Yeah. Right? And, we can talk about BGP, we can talk about prepend, we can talk about MEDs, we can talk about all the things that we normally talk about it from an infrastructure standpoint, but let me show you in real time what it takes for me to connect to Azure right now, okay? So, and make it part of the, all the full mesh lines that you saw. It's nothing, for me, it doesn't matter if it's a branch, a broom closet, janitor's closet, these are where we all know routers live sometimes, Mm -hmm. or a tablet, or PC, a campus, Azure, or AWS. It's my IPsec tunnel. I can reach it using 10 dot addressing, and we're going to show it to you right now. Yeah. Z. So, so I already plugged in my credentials into, into SCM. And the, well, just when I, when I enter them in, automatically the system goes out and it pulls what my available VPCs that are assigned to me that I have already constructed in Azure. So I'm going to concentrate down here at the bottom, and I'm going to go ahead and connect one of my uh, v, uh, VPCs that, that, is, that, are, that is assigned to me. As you can see at the bottom, if we follow the logs, it's, it's going through and showing you everything that is happening in the background. Now, this is all orchestration we have built in using the APIs that, that is making calls into Azure to figure out what networks are available and build out all the networking and to be able to build out and spin up an, a, an instance of a gateway in Azure and fully mesh it with all of our sites. Make sure I'm clear. You clicked go and it built everything. Yeah. So I connected. <laughs> We're almost there. No where yeah. to go. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so these VNets though, you've already gone into Azure and configured the VNet. Are they empty? Did, did does does I have Riverbed one, create the VNet? I mean, we didn't type in Tech Field A2, yeah. so uh, they are already existing. I created them in uh, um, in Azure. Okay. Yeah. A slash 16 address space. Right. In the VPC. I mean, did, did you create your gateway and all those things, or did Not you yet. just create a VNet? Just an I, empty it's, VNet it's a, with IP addresses. That's right. correct. Got it. Yeah. Now, so you just no. selected that one and said, now that one's connected to everything you have it will all be. over the place. It will be. By policy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it so will. Be. We try really hard to make it one click, because it's better, right? One click like Amazon, but we were afraid they would sue us, because I think <laughs> they sued another vendor for using one click. So we went with two click. <laughs> can't do us that, right? So we did the one I click at the virtual yeah, network, uh -huh. and then the two click is deploy. <coughs> That's it. So when we click, let's go. We don't want to be charged. Yeah. 
I love Microsoft, <laughs> I'm a shareholder. But. <laughs> so now what's happening? In the background, you're just going to see that the making of the sausage is happening. Okay? All the complicated thing of creating, essentially what I'm doing is I'm drop shipping a router virtually, yeah. and in a few minutes, that router boots up, downloads the latest firmware, downloads the latest rules that I created, and it boots and allows me to ping RDP, connect, use the app, whatever you want to do in Azure. But don't forget the magic, because we're going to show it to you. So, this server that's going to boot up is going to connect to Amazon, because if we go back to the dashboard, you'll notice that Azure's booting up here, West Instance, mm -hmm. But this is the point that I need to convey. Sometimes it gets lost in all the terminology. I don't care if it's Azure, Amazon, Broom Closet, Campus Location Data Center or not. It's just an endpoint that's inside my IPsec tunnel. It's that easy. So, that but but from a, if you go in and look at your Azure portal, mm -hmm. what you're going to see there is an instance that, that is a, a, a virtual riverbed appliance, that's right. right? And it's that's right. connected yeah. to your subscription via whatever VNet That's you just stood up that was empty. That's correct. correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. I drop shipped a virtual router and it's booting up now. Okay. We, is this license is a subscription inside of Azure for billing or is this, uh, can you buy permanent license. licenses correct. and and, and, license, uh, and deploy it that way as well? Yeah. All the licensing is through Microsoft Azure Marketplace. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And it's my account, it's so account. I would, I would so get it starts billed. with him, yeah. yeah. It starts with him saying, this is my account, tell me what I yeah. can yeah. Uh, play with. So, I want to do a quick, for all of my infrastructure brothers and sisters out there. It used to be, the app guy says, look, we're about to launch, we got to include you on the conversation, we're going to go live this weekend. Yep. I'm sure that's never happened to you. Ever. Happens to me all the time. You know why? Because infrastructure is always up, right? It's ubiquitous. It's always up. So app guys, a lot of times, I'm not picking on you app people, you just expect it to work. Just like you didn't thank the water company this morning for taking a shower. When you turn on this, that's happening right here. It's the making of the sausage. Um, <laughs> so, this is a conversation that we might have had. Phone rings, or we get an email, more likely. Hey, we're going live. Um, we're going to have 100 servers. We need a connection from this campus location to Azure as fast as you can do it, thanks. And by the way, we're going live this weekend. Now we can make all the excuses, hold on a second, I, have, I gotta make BGP changes, I gotta do IPsec, I gotta put a change control in, I gotta do that. You can do that, or while you're on the phone, you can click, click, two clicks, remember that two click? Identify the v, um, VPC, connect to it, deploy. Talk about the weather, talk about the, your football team, your soccer team, your hockey team, your basketball team. Shoot the breeze for a few minutes, and then before you hang up, you can say, oh, by the way, go ahead and ping that server. Click. <laughs> Drop the mic, walk out the room. <laughs> well, you can't see it. So that's the wasted mic. effort. But and I'm you don't have a microphone that. to drop, but other than that, Kevin, you could do Kevin, You can walk Kevin. out the room. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We actually have a term for what we just done. What's that? We've Uber. 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 Yeah. yeah. We, we have Uberfied the cloud. Mm. <laughs> On demand, you can request Hey, I want access to this VPC, to this network. With two clicks, your app is spinning a gateway that will automatically connect back to all your networks. And now you have access. Does that mean the VMs are all there out there roaming, waiting for you? <laughs> they just, they're just, they just fly to you? They are, all the servers are waiting to be called. All the VPCs are waiting to be called so, so we can connect them. So let's trust but verify. So By the way, free range VMs waiting to be made into software. <laughs> uh, Got it. By the way, one Feral of the use, VMs. That's right. <laughs> one, of the, one of the use cases this unlocks is what I've heard is that often you know, people want to be connecting into these clouds and linking their on-premises you know, locations, but because it's painful to do so, they still backhaul all that traffic down to the data center so you have one place to go. But this you can do from the branch. You can go direct to net, you know, to, to IaaS, just like you do for steering SaaS applications. Yep. And any policy you've set in place before about who can access what, it, it's in place, right? So now you can go direct to net very easy to IaaS without worrying about how hard it is or the security consequences or performance SLAs. As an infrastructure person, I'm imposing my will on Amazon. I'm imposing my will on Azure, and I'm making them play nice. 
So just, I don't want to get too up in the weeds and tell me that you don't want to answer this question, but getting IPSEC tunnels through the front end of AWS and Azure is a right pain in the rectal region. Yeah. And how are you overcoming that by, like, they just don't normally let this stuff through and getting an allocation of an IP address and, I mean, that's actually difficult. It is. So that's the magic. You can do this on your own, folks. SD-WAN, I'll, I'll let the cat out of the bag. There's nothing you can't do on your own with one exception, simplicity, okay? You can roll your own, and I'm sure some of you have. It takes about four hours, and if you don't do it all the time and someone asks for it again, go through your checklist and do it, um, or two click, you're there, okay? So what we've done is, we've worked very hard with Microsoft Engineering, okay? And Azure, we meet with Azure folks quite often. And, we, and, and Azure, they want this ease of entry to Azure. Think about, your typical customer, okay? Less than 1,000 users, less than 500 users. I don't want to worry about this server anymore. My boss is breathing down my neck. Are we going to adopt the cloud or not? Because you or your replacement will get me to the cloud. What have I given you? The ability to go to your boss and say, hey, you want that file server? You want that SQL server in the cloud? There it is. I'm done, it's built. It's one of these guys, the VPN's coming up right now. We can see that's why it's all red here. It's coming up. And the longest part of this is booting up that virtual router and VM in the cloud, okay? So what we're doing here is mm -hmm. that we've, we've stood up a riverbed, a virtual instance in the cloud, and we're using AWS Azure connectivity for yes. that, I assume. So it, under the covers, it's got a public IP that, that all the devices are. What if you need to drop an MPLS circuit into Azure okay. or into AWS. Is that something that you connect, can... Or an Express Connect. Right. Yeah. Can you connect that also into your Riverbed appliance and use that as an alternate connectivity yeah, method like absolutely. you would a physical? In fact, that's actually not a function of Riverbed. Microsoft has a KB article on how to connect multi-tenancy with Express Route. Okay, they can do that in Azure themselves. Okay, so for us, it's again another tunnel point. When I go to the data center, do, I can take Do you take have another route. instance for that though? Or does no, 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 just, it's, it's just natural routing through Express Route. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, so it's if natural routing yeah, through yeah. Express Route or direct to Azure instance because that's my address space. So I've got a question on you going into the cloud because you talked about um, you know putting this into the cloud and you're deploying this and I've got a file server here, but I guess one of the things you guys do is dedupe. So yeah. you know in certain cloud instances you're metered on you know what you're paying for in your bandwidth. So have you what have you guys done the numbers on that? What does that look like as far as saving you your cloud bandwidth costs? So um, Amazon enormous. and Microsoft are partners of us. They don't like us to talk about how no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> as an end user, yes, absolutely we reduced it. In fact, the reason why Z was able to download that file, that PowerPoint from, um, from Frankfurt so fast was because we had a dictionary and we learned, <clears throat> even on the cold pass, how much we can dedupe. That's been our secret sauce for 13 years. We brought that to the cloud, which means your billing's going to go down, we, but bottom line, your end users are going to be happier. Okay? Yeah. So. All right, so. And, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so I just want, so part of uh, what we have been working on for in, uh, over the past few months is be able to integrate a single click steelhead deployment into the cloud as well. So in AWS right now, I turn on a steel connect gateway and right behind it is a steelhead, which I also choose the size of the throughput that I want it to do. It's automatically done via a single click. If I want it to be remote, we I, don't I, want to get sued. Yeah. Oh. And I just um, you hit submit and off you go. So it will spin up both instances for you. And now anytime from anywhere your sites, if you're behind a steelhead, you will automatically optimize with AWS. Um, uh, Just be careful because you're, when you're WAN opping, you're burning CPU, and you might actually be burning more in CPU than you're saving in networking bandwidth. Um, I've seen it go both ways. I've seen, I've seen some really good savings yeah. on WAN optimization. I've seen SSL has really started to take a hit into if you're not managing your offload of your SSL. I've seen it take a hit, but I have clients that have steelheads and we've seen mm. we've some really great you know, problem resolutions. I'd say replication was the biggest one. But Absolutely. your CPU is free in a private cloud effectively once you've yeah. got the server except for power. But in the public cloud, you might need to put bigger and bigger CPUs and every time you buy a bigger CPU, you might be burning more cost in terms of bigger. So you really get, yeah, so that's a great you've point. Got so you've got to weigh how much am I saving on my bandwidth versus yeah. my CPU cost rising. And then, of course, you actually don't know how much you're going to get charged in any given day anyway. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah. But be the, the beauty about it is that because it's up there, I can easily 
take it down yep. or spin it up when I need it. So when I know I have a heavy workload, mm. I can turn it on, take advantage, then turn it down when I don't need it. And in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to do the same thing via single click, enable a steelhead inside of Azure as well, the same format as AWS. Yep. Can you do that through your REST API? Yes, yeah, it's all done from here, yeah. There's no interaction for us to do anything to, enable, to turn on a Seal Connect gateway and a steelhead inside the cloud. So to Greg's point, does that do you see a trade-off there? <coughs> the WAN optimization, the, the money you're saving in your 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 bandwidth cost offset so, any raise so, in CPU? Yep, I'll, I just, I'll address we, that in a different way. Yeah. So my business mandate is I have a certain amount of time to migrate a large set of data into the cloud. Mm -hmm. Perfect use case to move a, who moves large amounts of data to a faraway location better than a riverbed, right? So that's when the business mandate, right? versus the everyday balancing, but the beauty of it is you saw how easy it was to spin up, spin down instances, okay? So you can, we're at the verge of saying, you know what, it's cheaper than Amazon today. Let's go to AWS, change the rule. Oh, wait a minute, Azure is cheaper. Let's go to Azure for this weekend. We are, we can do that because of our software defined nature. So servers booted up. So Z, we're kind of running out of time. So let's go to the server, prove to folks that in fact these servers are up and running and that we can ping, we can RDP, and treat the Amazon and AWS as if it's my data center, my rack, yeah, my so, branch. Yeah. So inside of my AWS console, I can clearly see that I have a, a, a Steel Connect gateway and a Steelhead as well, and I've, I've got a server instance sitting right behind it turned on. And you can see that the internal and external IP address that uh, AWS assigned me. The same thing as well in the, the uh, Azure instance, from, uh, from Microsoft, I'm able to see the inside and outside. And what, what, what I'm going to do real quick is, be, and is RDP into both, um, uh, into both servers and show you the connectivity between both. So we're connected to Amazon in, where is that, Germany? Uh, uh, Amazon is in Germany, yes. And uh, yeah. The answer is, I don't care. <laughs> My data center. Right? The fact that it's in Frankfurt is almost incidental because I can just as easily move that to Singapore, just as easily move that to Ireland or anywhere else that I like. Okay, that's the point of Software Defined WAN. So we're logging in and we're going to do is ping the other server um, and obviously we don't have to go through the elaborate installing SQL servers or whatnot. Um, the other thing that you want to talk about is once you, ha once you can ping that server, what can you do as a server guy? You can call up the server folks and say, hey, I extended the connection. Go ahead and change your Active Directory and DNS to my server in Azure. And then I've extended my identity management via Active Directory to AWS as if they're my data center. And that's the secret, okay? Um, so we're logging in to, this is like the cooking show part of it where I, could, I wish I could put it in the oven, cut the camera, and take a beautifully cooked part out, but, um, so this is the windows coming up in Azure right now. All right. Can I ask a connectivity question? Absolutely. Via Twitter while we were waiting. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe Nicholas, I don't know if it's Michelle, I don't know how to say his last name. Anyway, he was asking about routing protocols, right? I mean, because we're a room of traditional network engineers. We know BGP, SPF, EIGRP. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to integrate your product from a traditional routing standpoint? Because we all still- Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. traditional transport, we yep. still got to get from here to there. Yep, and so the answer to that question is going to happen in about five minutes when Z talks about data center design, how we don't expect you to forklift upgrade, folks. We're not going to come in and say, throw out everything you know, put us in. We seamlessly fit into a BGP world where we attract routes so that we can do our magic and put it back out, okay? So we'll go, with the, okay. go into that in detail. Wait. All right, so the server's been coming up. Um, we can ping, did we ping while we were talking, Z? Uh, uh, here we go. Yep, there we go. So. And this is Frankfurt, I think. Yes. We can go to uh, uh, Azure side, which is in San Jose here so. as well. So that server's up and connect to it. And this is actually the latency of Germany. So flip over to Azure side on the, so we can see The, yeah, the this is the problem of distance, right? Cloud is great until that latency kicks you in the butt. And we're going to show you how to uh, prove that and fix that in just a second. So while this is connecting, so this is going back to the cooking show, 
This is RDP, this is not us, this is just RDP coming up in Azure. Um, it's going to connect. Go to bring up the dashboard for me, Z. Sure. And let's go back to proof but verify. Yep. We're all infrastructure. I get the tunnel, underlay, overlay. That's great. I get it, conceptually. But in the real world, what does it mean? Let's check out New York and see how New York office is doing. And we can do it a couple different ways. We can zoom in on the path or we can look at it from the site. It's context sensitive. So remember that bolt on versus built in? Our visibility is built in, not bolted on. And that means I can click and Z, take it away. Yeah. So uh, we're introducing a new tool uh, called Insight. This is part, it builds upon our Steel Central uh, feature set that we have, and it's, it's available for our customers uh, to be used. Anywhere you are in, the, uh, in, the, in your organization, anywhere you click, you're able to zoom in on that view of that specific context that you're in. So for example, I highlighted on the New York site, and, and I just go ahead and I use a launch point, you know, the, from, the, from that button to launch into, um, uh, into this instance right here to see what is happening at that New York site. So all these metrics now are being sent from uh, Seal Connect Manager into, uh, into Insight, and we're going to be able to relate that data and find out, okay, what's going on, what is happening on the link. Because w one of the main issues with being able, to, when, you, when, you, when we start IPsecing is we effectively, you know, just make ourselves blind. Is, well, how can I see what's inside of that tunnel? Well, how much traffic is actually going MPLS? How much traffic is actually going over internet? Did I move the traffic right? And who is actually using that traffic inside of that tunnel? And what is it composed of? And this is what we are bringing to life right here with Insight. As you can see right here, all I have to do is, this is the top view for the entire site called New York City. And all I have, to, and I can see right here, just by highlighting, is that I'm able to see that this is for the New York City, the, the first provider, being the, the internet uh, connectivity. I can see, okay, we've been running about 30 megs of throughput. Just highlight on the second yellow line, line down below it, and this is my, uh, well, yeah. the first one was MPLS. This, this is the, the, the internet line. I can see that we're sitting about, uh, the MPLS is sitting about just under 10 megs uh, per second. If I want to, I can go in and highlight down into it and see, well, who's, what's actually writing inside of that internet connectivity? From, just from the main view right here looking, I can tell you, if we look at the, the pie chart, is that FTP is, about, is using about 40% about of the bandwidth inside of that link. So I, all I have to do is just highlight and drill down into it. Now I'm getting a view specific on what is using that internet link. And about 60% of the traffic inside of that internet link is FTP. If I glance over to the right, and make sure, okay, it's about 65 megs of traffic and it's, it is FTP traffic. And if, if I glance down on the bottom, I can see that Steve Parsons, who is using that FTP application, and he is the main abuser of that link. Aggressor. You know, maybe. Aggressor. Aggressor. So aggressor. He's aggressor, yeah. <laughs> so. so in my in, world, I just trust it but verify. Well, if I'm getting a complaint, and I know he's not supposed to be doing that, at daytime, because it was supposed to, he agreed that he would transfer the massive file at nighttime, what could I do? I can go to my software defined WAN and find him and yeah. put a rule for FTP and put him in a lower class. And in real time, yes, his life will suck, but it's a shared medium, everybody else uh, will be happier. Okay, this is the power of having that visibility that's built in versus bolted on, right? You can troubleshoot underlay overlay these are abstract concepts until you see it presented this way. This is inside my tunnel. This is what's happening in the real world and that we've exposed that. Yes. So I'm assuming it's, it's uh, <clears throat> checking it before it hits the tunnel. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we have done so we know. It. You're not decrypting anything. Yeah, so we know what's happening. Uh, and, and by the way, if you notice the names here, it's the same DPI engine, okay? Not random IP addresses, but it's Google, Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Google Ads here, Amazon Shopping. Click on that person, say no be shopping well we all do it so I single-handedly keep UPS in business I think with my prime membership um, okay so that was uh, trust but verify of software defined WAN so let me just kind of summarize what we've done because sometimes it's so fast so easy we miss the magic in two clicks we connected to Azure what have I done Azure Amazon doesn't matter it's my data center I can use it and do whatever I want with it internally I could be sitting in a campus, I could be sitting on a laptop, 
in a Marriott hotel with my VPN client. I'm directly connected to Azure as if it's sitting next to me. It's my address space. I've imposed my will on the cloud infrastructure. I'm not locked into a cloud because Amazon and Azure are talking to one another. They're playing nice, okay? We just became UN for the cloud. That's what we did, right? You're not locked into the cloud. You want to check out Azure? Knock yourself out. When you're done, disconnect. Are you doing that by setting up a tunnel between yes, Amazon absolutely. and Azure? Yes, absolutely. So one of the tunnels in between was AWS and Frankfurt, Germany, and that's Amazon connecting to uh, AWS. So if you zoom out here, one of these lines going up is actually going to Frankfurt, AWS, and Azure. Yeah. Okay? And the other thing we did, we routed applications. I don't have to worry about IP addresses anymore. I can say this user can do this with this application using this path. And here's the secret part that I didn't let loose earlier. The rule follows the user. So if the HR person takes the computer and goes to a different site, all that firewall prevention rule, it follows the user. Can, can we? Sorry. I was going to ask about user ID stuff. Yeah, how are you doing but, the mapping? Yeah. So we're doing the mapping by two ways. We're checking the MAC address and also the Active Directory username. What you didn't see because we did it ahead of time is when a new device, in fact, if you guys connected to Tech, Tech Field Day, Tech Field Day access point, we'll have users popping up here and you have a choice. You can say unfettered uh -huh. access, internet only, or quarantine, or self-register using You'll SMS. You'll have users popping up? Or Unknown address. users that you have to say. But there's a main, is it a main Mac, address. Mac yeah. mapping yeah. between MAC address and, and the user? user. No. Where does the private key for the Active Directory live? Because you're going to, to attach to Active Directory, you're going to have to hold a key. So no, what we key. do is we suck down the username. Yes. I don't, Z, do we have a, the Riverbed's uh, Active Directory server on here? Um, no, and not 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 in this demo. And yeah, it's fine. Not it's in principle, but yeah, the the, yeah. the, the plugins You'll, are there to be able to link to it. Right, so you link to it and be you able can to get the username to, without because yeah, right, the latest version of SIFS is encrypted, so or it can be encrypted, and which means you need the private key to decrypt it. Who's been doing yeah. encrypted SIFS? Well, the latest version of Windows does, yeah. and we, this but only if you distribute the private key to the edge of the network. We've been doing that, right? Absolutely. You got it. <laughs> encrypted SMB, we've been doing that through Active Directory integration on the Steelhead side. Yep. And this is why we can accelerate encrypted SMB right. as well. That's right. I thought I just okay. to raise that. Okay, so um, we're running out of time. So Z is now going to step away. Uh, so, do you have yes. a question? Absolutely. I know it's your secret sauce, so I know that you can't really dive into it too much. Are you breaking encryption and identifying what's in the packet? Um, so we have a couple different ways of doing that, and we have a patented way of becoming a trusted SSL tunnel. And, w and here's the sequence of events, okay? It's not, it's not secret sauce. We take um, the user's <laughs> traffic, uh, and we form a tunnel to the local uh, steelhead, okay? Or steelhead SD. Um, and what we do is from there, we have an inside tunnel that we build on our own, SSL. So while, we, while the traffic comes to our steelhead locally at the branch, we look and see what it is, and then we create the dictionary. We put it into an encrypted drive. So it's encrypted in flight. It's encrypted at rest. We take the symbols, shoot the symbols across to the head end steelhead or the cloud steelhead sitting in Amazon. He reconstitutes the dictionary to form the PowerPoint and then pops it out and gives it to the server. Okay? So uh, for, for the clear answer, you are playing man in the middle with, the, with, with yeah. an encryption for long, encryp for, encrypted stream. Yeah, for, for, okay. a long time, for a long time, the steelheads have been optimizing SSL for a long time. Yep. And again, if you go, if you want to look, if you, you know, it sounds like you're really interested. There's a whole treatment of this back from the August 2015 tech field okay. that was right here. Fair Take enough. a look, and we have a whole session yep. on okay. the two-phase process. And while we're on that subject, if a vendor <clears throat> comes to you and says, I'll accelerate SSL just like Riverbed, but give me the master certificate, give me that certificate, and let's put it out on the branch, your response should be, no. <laughs> well, he says no, I would have said, <laughs> hell no. <laughs> no. <laughs> My ass. But you're, doing that My for, ass. but you're doing that for encrypted SMB. Yes, we are. So what's the difference? Because we have Active Directory integration as well. Yeah, but, but remember, still... the difference is, yeah. the difference is, okay, Active Directory is different because we sync to Active Directory to have the credentials to look at that, all right? 
And that HTTP perspective, uh, one of the key differences is that we don't have to have a certificate that belongs in the data center to be sitting out at the branch location. Why? Physically, it's not as secure. We all understand this, right? Data center has man traps, women traps, person traps, and 37 other different identities, gender identities, because we are in San Francisco. Look it up in New York, where I'm from, 37 officially recognized identities uh, or genders. So all of those traps are there for physical security. Branch, it's not. That's why uh, we, when we started this, we said we will never expect our customers to put their certificate that's in the server and put it out through remote location.